A few weeks ago, I was praying about uh, our gatherings on a Sunday, and God put something on my heart that I was not expecting, very unexpected. Um, I was praying that he would uh, speak to me and, and that I would have ears to hear and it would be clear, you know, what it is that he wanted to say to me about our gathering, but I didn't expect him to say what he did to me. Uh, and for those of you who aren't comfortable or acquainted with the idea of God talking to us, I'm not talking about him speaking in an audible voice, just impressing upon my heart, right? So, so just impressed on my heart that there was a couple that would be at uh, one of our gatherings, and, and he was very specific about which one. And he said, in that gathering, I want you to just say something to that effect. Just talk about the fact that that couple is here. And uh, I want you to, to tell them that uh, what they're praying about, what they're considering, is something I'm leading them to do. And I just want you to encourage them to go ahead and follow me and, and do it. And I thought, oh, God, I'm not really particularly comfortable with that. I said, I don't know who's going to hear what if I do that, and somehow that might be construed as license to anybody in the room. Who's so like, I understand, I understand. So, so he was very specific. He said, he said, here's what's going on. He said, they've already prayed, believing that it's me leading, and they're asking me for confirmation. You're going to be their confirmation. I said, I can do that. So uh, I shared that information. And um, I, I didn't ask them to identify themselves. You know, it's just personal and private. But I said, hey, if you're inclined, uh, come up afterwards and let me know if, if that actually was you, that that, that you know, information was, uh, was uh, you know, relevant for. And so uh, we dismissed the gathering and nobody came up. And I was uh, up here in the front and then pretty soon somebody walked up and said, my, uh, fiance, my fiance and I were on our way out and in the lobby he leaned over, elbowed me and said, isn't that just amazing? I just knew I had to come back and tell you the story. So she came back and told me the story. And she said uh, that she had uh, a sister that uh, had just moved down to Arizona, I think it was, and uh, there, there was a niece that wanted to stay here and finish out school locally and be with friends and stuff. But in order to do that, uh, they would have to take her in. And, and uh, so she had considered it, but I mean, it's not even her fiance's daughter. It's not her daughter, it's her niece, and you know, they're getting ready to get married, and that might not be a good thing as you start off a marriage to have somebody else living with you that you're not accustomed to, you know, all that. So they were just trying to decide if that was a wise decision or not. They both had it in their hearts to do, but they just didn't know if it was the right thing to do. And uh, so they had prayed Saturday night and asked God for confirmation, came here Sunday morning, and God had put that specific thing on my heart to share with them. And they walked out of here just walking on air at God's graceful and merciful and faithful uh, commitment to them to hear their prayers, to answer their prayers, and to lead and to guide them. That was me being used by God in a way I had not expected at all. And it was for them a very unexpected and very quick response to prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I, when, I, when she shared that story, of course, I rejoiced in that. I, I just was so excited for them and just thanking God that he is that kind of a God that he would love us enough to do that and care for us. And then I got to thinking as they walked away, I, I, I thought, I wish all my prayers got answered that fast. <laughs> Pray at night and the answer comes in the morning. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice if it all worked that way, you know? 36 hours or less? No, let's make it 12 hours or less. That'd be pretty nice. But anyway, God in his faithfulness to them did an unexpected thing. And I, I reveled in that and, and uh, I was encouraged by that. And then I had another unexpected thing happen. I had a pastor friend of mine say, he said, I, I woke up at um, like two in the morning and I couldn't sleep. So I was praying and God put you on my heart. He said, I've been praying for you. And he said, uh, God's been doing something in you lately. And he just wanted me to tell you that kind of like how you stir up a fire in a fire pit and kind of, you know, stoke the fire, gets the flames going and all that, that God wants to stir up in you and, and fan the flames of what he's doing currently in your life. And I knew right away as he shared that with me that it was related to the things that had been happening in our series supernatural and, and uh, things like the story that I just told you. And so I, I was, I mean, this is a pastor that I know. He's a friend of mine, but we don't have that kind of relationship. I don't wake up at two in the morning and pray for him. Never have. Don't plan on it. Uh, I don't think he was planning on praying for me that night. It's like, I, I, in fact, I said to him, I said, I apologize. I'm sorry that you lost sleep on my account. But he said, hey, no worries. But, but it was a completely unexpected thing. And I realized that God in his faithfulness to me 
uh, knew exactly what was going on in my life, where I was walking, the path I was on, the things that were going on, and he put it on that person's heart to do for me what God had put on my heart that helped that one couple in such a big way. Those are the unexpected kinds of things that I think we should expect. Like, you don't know how or what or when or who, but God, I just expect the unexpected. I just expect you to do some cool things. I want to be part of that. I'm signing up for that. I'm making myself available for that. On the, on the giving end, on the receiving end, I just think, God, that, that I, I think that walking with you is an adventure. It should, be an, it should be interesting. It should not be in any way boring or disappointing. And, and so I just want to... I just want to raise the level of adventure. I want to raise the level of availability. I want to raise the level of sensitivity to your spirit prompting me so that I can be a part of stuff you're doing every day in people's lives, in our midst, in our community, all over the world. What a wonderful and, and uh, exciting but often unexpected journey we have the privilege of being on. Well, the Christmas story, as we've been saying in this series, was entirely unexpected. It was exactly like those stories I just shared with you. Things that people didn't see coming happened. Now, the problem for us is it's all too familiar. So for us, it's very expected. You know, at, at, at this time of year, we just expect the Christmas story, nativity scenes, and all that goes with the cultural trappings. But imagine if you can, and we've been trying to help you with this every week, imagine if you can rewind before any of that has happened, and there is no culture, and there are no trappings about the birth of Jesus, and it's playing out in real time in the life of Joseph and Mary, two unexpected individuals. They were in their opinion, an unexpected person. That was week one, an unexpected person. And then God doing some things in their life, and then the shepherds getting involved and the wise men getting involved in, in ways that were certainly unexpected timing. That was week two. And today we're going to talk about unexpected people. See, it's, it's unexpected sometimes for me to think, oh, God, God actually wants to, to use me in a, in a way I never thought he did. How fun is that? What a privilege that is. And we, we really laid that out in week one. And then in week two, it's like, he wants to use me now, like today. Like, I don't have to be ready. I just have to be available. And if you missed either one of those messages, I want to encourage you to watch them in their entirety on our website or on the app. They're available there. But, but today, we're going to talk about unexpected people, the people that God wants to use me to touch, the people that God wants to use me to help the people that God wants to use me to love and encourage and draw to him and help them have a relationship with him, to share truth with them in a way that's loving and gracious and winsome and compelling and irresistible. You see, God wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of some unexpected people. And if you're available, if you're willing, if you're open, if you can let go of some of the restrictions that you may have in your thinking about how God can use you or with whom God can use you, if you'll allow yourself to be big-hearted and open-minded, then you can expect the opportunity to love people that you're not expecting to love right now. I, I believe this is the Christian life. As we follow Jesus, we can expect to have the opportunity to love people we don't expect to love. When I was a brand new Christian, I ended up, within months of my coming to faith in Christ, I was 19 years of age, and I traveled to Europe, and I was involved in an outreach. There were 600 of us involved in this loosely organized outreach during the Olympic Games that were in Munich, Germany. And I know for some of you, I really have just dated myself. But anyway, that goes way back. But, but I mention that only because it helped me get off to a very good start because there we were in this international melting pot, people from all over the world speaking all kinds of languages with all kinds of backgrounds, with all different kinds of cultures that they represented, with all different skin colors. There were, just this, there were all these people, and we had an opportunity to love them and to share Jesus with them whenever the Lord opened up an opportunity, gave us a chance, whenever we had a moment with someone, we had this tremendous opportunity to internationally represent Jesus. And, and it was a memorable experience, but a great foundation for all of the years that have followed, right up to the very present. I think that 
God did in me early on, something that helped me not in any way be surprised when he gave me an opportunity to love people that I didn't expect I was going to have the opportunity to love, right? So more recently, my wife and I, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife and I uh, had bought about 14 years ago, we bought a set of apartments and the type of apartments they were and the rent level they were at on the community that or the neighborhood they were in uh, resulted in most of our tenants being uh, low income and, and uh, often very disadvantaged individuals. Uh, on again, off again with employment, often coming out of very uh, hard and tragic circumstances, um, living lives that are very different than the life that I live, uh, looking and sounding uh, different than most of the people that I normally would hang out with, some of them uh, involved in things that I certainly didn't, didn't approve of. In fact, at one point, one of our tenants was selling drugs out of the apartment. The police had to get involved. So it was, it was one of those situations where I didn't realize it going into it, but as it unfolded and I look back on it, I realized God was using me being a landlord to these tenants as an opportunity for him to teach me this. Craig, you, you didn't expect to have an opportunity to love these people. And I found myself loving them even when I didn't want to get involved sometimes in their lives. I just want to be the landlord, you know, collect the rent and, you know, be, be kind of out of the, the picture. I found myself getting wrapped up in their lives and caring about them and loving them and helping them. I even went to court with one of them and tried to help them get some government assistance and I always gave them a, you know, a reprieve on their rent and was very understanding. I was probably a bit too much of a pushover. But anyway, it was just an opportunity to, to love people. And God did some things in my heart over that. Now, we've since sold those and don't have those. But I find myself again and again marveling at the, situation God, the situations that I find myself in that God puts me in that give me an opportunity to love people in Jesus' name that, that I didn't expect or see coming. So I, I don't know about your experiences. I, those are some of mine. Um, but, but I find myself often challenged when, I, when I'm in a situation and somebody who's different than me, different than me in whatever way, they have a different political point of view, they speak a different language, they smell different than I do, they use language I don't use, they have a different level of education than I have. They have different beliefs than I do. When, when I'm in situations where people are enough different from me that I feel a little uncomfortable, I realize that the Spirit of God is wanting to work in me to change me and help me to see them and relate to them the way He does. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Who is hard for you to love? For some of you, the, the answer is, well, the person I'm sitting next to, <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes it's the person closest to us that's hardest to love, right? I mean, it could be our good friend or our fiance or it could be our parents. My kids have no problem loving me. They, they can't just help themselves. They just, it just got, all right, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit. But, you know, family members sometimes that, or, or people that are close or coworkers, you know, we spend more time with coworkers often than we do close friends and family. And so those relationships that are the closest sometimes are the most challenging. It's like, really? God wants me to love this person? It's like, I didn't expect to have to love them. I'm, I barely tolerate them, right? You know, I, I'm, I wish I didn't have to work with them or I wish I wasn't related to them. If, if only they hadn't married that person, then I wouldn't be related to that person. I wouldn't have to deal with them at the family gatherings. You know, I mean, we get kind of in that mindset and God's just saying, like, like hold on, time out. No, this is not what I've called you to. You're going to follow me. I want you to love everybody all the time. Like, wow, well, that's just not realistic. No, it's impossible for you as a human being, but it's not impossible if you allow me to help you. So who's, who's hard for you to love? Are those Republicans just too much for you to love? Or is it the Democrats? Or are you like some of us, you just think both parties are hard to love? <laughs> is it the, the poor people that live on the street? Or is it those really well-to-do people that live on the hill? 
Is it those married people that are always talking about their kids? Or those single people? It, you see, we all at some point reach a, a, an edge to our comfort level and then we find ourselves in a situation where it's a little hard to love them. In other words, we're talking about loving the unlovable. And really nobody's unlovable, not in God's view. But in our view, sometimes people are unlovable. You know, that person who hurt me 26 years ago. Really? 26 years later and you're still having a hard time loving them? For some of us, that's reality. When my parents were divorced, my dad left my mom to be with a woman he'd been having an affair with, and he loved her kids more than he loved us. And I resented it. And I did not want to love his kids. They were my age. We occasionally see each other. And I had a huge wall. For me, it was hard to love them because they were the kids of the person who wrecked my home, destroyed my dad and mom's marriage, etc. Who, who's, who's hard for you to love? Well, we're going to turn to our story from God's Word today, a story in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, that tells us about an unexpected person in the story, the unfolding story of the birth of Jesus. He's a man by the name of Simeon. Most people don't know his name. He's not typically associated with the Christmas story, but he's very much a part of it. And in verse 25, it says this. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Now that consolation of Israel phrase is the expectation that all Israel had, had had for generations, that their Messiah would come and bring them comfort and relief and deliverance, okay? So he's waiting for the Messiah to come. Verse 26 says, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That's an interesting thing to live with. Like, God's, God told me, I'm not going to die before the Savior comes to earth. Imagine the Lord speaking to you about his second coming that way. I'm not going to die. I'll be alive at the Lord's return. There is an event that's yet future to us, and he will come again, and very possibly some, many, maybe all of us will be alive when he comes. But this man Simeon knows, even though he's elderly at this point, that he's not going to die before he sees the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit... He went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Now, the reason Mary and Joseph are bringing Jesus into the temple is to be in obedience to a law that had to do with the presentation of a, of a child, firstborn male, according to certain prescribed things. And they're compliant with that as they show up on this occasion. And uh, they run into Simeon, unexpected, I'm sure, on their part, but not unexpected at all by Simeon because he'd been looking for this day. The next verse tells him that he took him in his arms and praised God. I, I, I want us just to stop for a second. Have you recently held a newborn baby? A couple of weeks ago, Scott talked about, uh, about holding one of his friend's newborn babies. They're, they're so... They're so innocent and fragile and vulnerable and there's something about, about babies, you know. But imagine that the baby you're holding is the savior of the world and you're Simeon and you know it. I just, I can't, I can't wrap my mind and my heart around what a special, privileged moment he's having. And then he speaks. Next verse. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I'm, I'm ready to go. I can die now. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now listen. Listen to what he says. Pay attention to the words. And keep in mind, Mary and Joseph are listening to this man, Simeon, who unexpectedly has taken baby Jesus and is saying these things. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared What's this phrase? In the sight of all nations. In what way is the birth of Jesus in the sight of all nations? There's something bigger going on. Simeon knows it. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. 
There are no Gentiles involved at this point in this story directly. But there's something larger going on, something bigger. And the glory of your people Israel. Now see, for the average Jewish devout person like Simeon, for the average person in Israel at that time, their expectation was that the Messiah would come, he'd be a savior and a deliverer for the nation of Israel. And even though they should have understood, most of them did not understand that God's intention always was from the very beginning to, to, to bless and to bring salvation to all nations on earth. But, but they had gotten very ingrown and they were basically thinking in terms of the Messiah as their savior. They really weren't thinking a lot about anybody else, but God was and Simeon knew it. And when he says these kinds of things, a light for revelation of the Gentiles, and he says it first, and the glory of your people Israel second, that is not what Joseph and Mary would have expected. That's why the next verse tells us this. It says, the child's father and mother marveled at what was being said about him. In other words, what came out of Simeon's mouth was completely unexpected. Like, what's he talking about? Now, they already know that their privileged parents who have been charged with the responsibility, the angel has appeared to them, God's spoken to them. I mean, they're aware of that. So what is it that they're marveling at? What's the unexpected factor? The fact that Simeon is talking about the Gentiles and all the nations of the earth in the way that he is. And now they're realizing that their, their child has a purpose that goes way beyond Israel. And even though they should have known that, even though things were said that would indicate that by the angel when he appeared to Joseph and so on, they, they, they are starting to have a realization that there is something really big going on here. That there are some unexpected people that live in faraway places on the continent of South America, in Southeast Asia, in China and Siberia and Alaska and North America and Europe and all over the world that at that time were living in all those places and this baby that Simeon is holding that is their child to care for, he's the savior of all of them. That he cares about all of them. That there are some unexpected people that go beyond what they might be thinking as typical Jewish people of the day. See, God, God just wants to enlarge our hearts and broaden our thinking. And if we will allow him to, there are people that we'll be able to love and influence and help that otherwise we wouldn't be able to because of our own limited thinking, our own prejudice, our own racism, our own bigotry, our own insecurity that causes us to put a wall up in the face of something that's uncomfortable or unfamiliar to us or that's difficult to relate to or in some way perceived as threatening. But those are precisely the moments when the Spirit of God wants to say, hey, can I count on you to love people in this situation even though I know you didn't expect to be here? Can I count on you to love them? in my name? Can I count on you to lovingly and, and, and gr graciously share my truth with them? Can I count on you to be an instrument of mine in this situation? And, and those are the kinds of unexpected things that God has in store for us if we'll make ourselves available and open-minded and big-hearted enough to embrace them. There are people for you to love that God will use you to love that are on the other side of the political aisle from you. Oh, I'd never love them. They're wrong. So, what if they are wrong? Love them anyway. Well, I don't know. I'm really uncomfortable around those, uh, you know, LGBTQ people. It's just like, I don't get that. I don't relate to that. I don't think that's right. Yeah, so, love them anyway. Well, you know, those people that live on the street, you know, it's just, I don't know, they're... I just, you know, and they hold up the cardboard sign or they're living on the street under a bush or a tree or behind a building or in an alley. It's, I, don't, I don't understand that. It's like, I just never let myself get to that place. I just, they're, they just made bad choices. Hey, stop with the opinions. Love them anyway. That's what Mike and Jesse Kovac did. 
part of our congregation started Blessings Under the Bridge many years ago, just decided to go down on the streets of Spokane and love them anyway. And it's grown into this huge thing that's gone on for years now. Uh, a book's coming out. Um, it's gotten national attention. Other cities have been inspired to do similar things in their cities. Without opinion, without judgment, without barriers and walls to protect our threatened or insecure selves, to just go out into the world and love them anyway is one of the trademarks and characteristics of what it means to be a Christ follower. And it's what God's calling us to do. And he just may want to use you to love some people that you weren't expecting to love. Like your in-laws this Christmas. Really? I mean, you know they're going to probably show up. Why not decide now? You know what? I'm going to be big-hearted and open-minded, and I'm going to love Uncle Johnny anyway. The whole family holds him accountable for what he did 39 years ago. By the way, in my wife's family, there is an Uncle Johnny, and the family did hold him accountable for stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not talking hypothetical. You've got situations like that. There's that somebody in your extended family somewhere, somebody that everybody else kind of steers a, berth, a wide berth around and tries to avoid. And, you know, you, just, you, you don't even want to go to the family gathering because then you have to make small talk with this person you don't even like, right? Come on, people. If we're going to follow Christ, it's time we had God's heart for people to have the heart he has for them. He loves them them. And by the way, he'd say the same, same thing to them about you. Because they don't want to love you either. And God's saying to them, you know what? Even though you, in their opinion, are wrong or different or unlovable for whatever reason, God would say to them, hey, I want you to love the people in this room as well. Right? See, Jesus really just zeroed in on this in a place that's familiar to us, some of us anyway. John chapter 13. This is right before he is going to die. He's in the upper room with his disciples. And in verse 34, he says this, a new command, I give you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. Now, unfortunately for some of us, that's familiar enough that it's almost white noise. So let's back up a little bit and slow down. A new command, what's new about it? Because the command to love one another is actually something that goes all the way back to the beginning. It's all through the Old Testament. What's new? The new command to love one another as I've loved you, this, what's new about it is that Jesus broke down barriers. What has he just done? He, the creator of the world, he, the son of God, he who knew he came from God and was going back to God, who was the savior of the world, he had taken off his outer garments and put on a towel and got a basin of water and washed their feet. And you don't do that. Servants do that. You don't do that if you're somebody of esteemed position, someone who's respected. But Jesus, knowing all those things were true about himself, he still washed their feet. And in washing their feet, he broke down barriers and he said, listen, that, that, that's not something anybody would choose to do, but I did it for you and I want you now to love other people. In other words, I want you to love people even though their feet stink. Right? And he's not, he, he doesn't tell them to go out literally and wash feet. He's saying, I want you to, to love people even though there's something about them that's off-putting. And, and I don't, I mean, the, the biblical account doesn't tell us this, but I suspect that it was implied. I, I think the disciples got it. Hey guys, I just washed your feet and they don't smell very good. Seriously. They, they walk in sandals every day and sweat. And, you know, by the end of the summer, my uh, flip-flops, they stink. I have to wash them. Come on. And Jesus is saying, listen, I just loved you in a very practical way. Now I want you to go do that for people who, for whatever reason, you find off-putting. And here's why. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if... If, if, big if, if you love one another. If you love one another. Who is hard for you to love? That's the question that I gave you earlier. I ask it again. 
My wife was sharing with me some stuff she was reading on Facebook. Um, I don't really do Facebook. And by the way, if you sent me a message on Facebook and I didn't respond, it's because I don't communicate on Facebook with anybody. So, um, so call the church. I don't know. Call, come up and see me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk with you. I just I don't do Facebook that way. But she keeps me kind of in the loop a little bit about things she thinks that I would either be interested in or need to know. And she said, you might be interested in this. She said uh, something about an individual who had posted on Facebook about their anticipated marriage to a member of the same sex and how this person was the love of their life, a gift from God, and uh, this person, they, you know, just so um, in love with this individual. And then what was interesting to me were the comments. And she read a few of them. And uh, one of them just said, hey, check it out. That person's not from God. You can look it up in the Bible. And then somebody else said, hey, ignore the naysayers. Follow your heart and do what you want. And so everybody had a response. And I thought about that and I thought, you had basically a couple of extremes. You had people that felt like they were armed with the truth, beating the person with truth. And then you had other people that were ignoring the truth of what God's word said or ignorant of it and just loving the individual. And God calls us to do both. To be bearers of truth and not compromise God's word. And if you're here new to Mary Chapel or a guest of someone else, you're checking it out and you're wondering about what I'm saying and how this applies to you. Listen, if you're going to choose to follow God, you're going to choose to, to embrace not only his forgiveness, receive his love and the gift of eternal life, but you're embracing his truth and you're allowing him to tell you how he wants life lived. In other words, he's not just your savior, your, your, your ticket to heaven. He wants to be your Lord and best friend and have the kind of relationship with you that he's longed for all along. And so, so you sign up, not just for God's love, but for God's truth. In other words, this whole thing called the human experience, this whole planet and all that's created, is all his doing. He made it, so he gets to set the rules. So there are... There are is absolute truth. There are black and white things. And so in our relating to people, we don't want to compromise what's clear and what's true, what's black and what's white. But we got to get better at loving people. The truth shared lovingly is irresistible. The truth shared lovingly is compelling. The truth used as a club is off-putting and is an embarrassment to the cause of Christ. The Bible says an interesting thing about Jesus, and I'll conclude with this. It says that Jesus came, and he was full of grace and truth. He was full of graciousness, love, and mercy, and all of that, but he was also full of truth. He was uncompromising, and what he said was right and true. And so we need to be more like Jesus in that respect and have that kind of balance. Um, let, let me just very quickly throw in 1 John 3, verses 23 and 24, because it really helps summarize what I've been saying. This is his command, to believe in the name of his Son. So believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. What are the two things he's saying to do? Believe in Jesus, his Son, and do what? Love one another. And you can count on it. The people you'll have opportunity to love will be unexpected. Jesus excelled in loving the unlovable. Come on. And I put it in quotes because nobody's really unlovable. He all, the way, if we had his heart, we'd see nobody as unlovable. He loves everybody with the same kind of unconditional love. He loves you and me. But he excelled at loving the unlovable and he calls us to follow him. So what does that mean? He wants us to love the unlovable too. He wants us to love everybody all the time, and we can too. With his help, we will. Let's pray.